Claire Bob Euchre? That must be in the front row. Yeah. <laughs> that must be in the front row. Yeah. I guess we're uh, we're here. We're going to get started. Thank you all for coming. I'm Jim Angopoulos, and uh, I'm one of the sponsors of the event. And we have a few other men here that are uh, co-sponsors, and it's totally private. We're not affiliated with any organization, no church, no entity, no uh, no weird libertarian group or anything like that. So we're <laughs> sorry, Tom. <laughs> Uh, our purpose here is to uh, uh, talk, have a talk, and uh, promote ideas, or at least discuss ideas, and uh, and try to come to the truth together. So uh, there is z zero censorship here. By the way, just in case there are censors in the building, if someone could shut that door, that'd be great. We managed to come to this hotel for. Uh, 21 years now. I think we started in uh, October of 2001, right here in this very room. Our first speaker uh, was Otto Scott. That was back in the day. And since then, we've had, you know, your, the card that we mail out is, I don't know if anybody, if you haven't got one of these cards, please fill out those um, slips at the front desk there so that we can mail you these in the future. These names and addresses are used only for these cards and nothing else. Nobody ever sees these. Half the time I can't even find where they are. No. No. But anyway, no, seriously though, we need you to fill this out. We, we changed it this time around because we figured out that some of you have been coming, but you've moved or whatever, so you don't have your same address, even though you're always here. So after a while, these are not going to get forwarded to you, and then they come back, and then I have to go back through like years of these to figure out what went wrong. Maybe you moved or maybe you, and you didn't tell us or whatever, but we try to try to update those lists and uh, uh, this time around, I think we got fewer of them back than ever before, but it's really important that you fill this out for us because it helps me to make sure you're invited to the next event, which I think the next event is the very last Saturday of April. It's always on a Saturday. It's usually this time of year and then late April, early May. So. Uh, also, I'm going to have an uh, at, we're going to have a Q&A session after our speaker uh, gives his talk, and his, he'll be speaking for about one hour, and then we'll have a one-hour Q&A, and that's also a very exciting part of this gathering. A, a lot of times people slip out and uh, at the halfway point, but I, I strongly recommend you stay for the whole thing because sometimes uh, it can get pretty pretty uh, interesting in the second second part of the Q&A session. Uh, our, looks like our visiting Zionist is not here today, so yeah, it, we may not have as many fireworks as you. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we do continuously invite the, uh, the Zionist so that he can come here. Uh, you know, kind of like how they used to have the opposing point of view after, the, after, the, after President Reagan would speak. You know, they'd have the Democrat give the opposing point of view. Then it, when Clinton got elected, there was no more opposing point of view anymore. So we had Clinton, Bush, Obama. There was no opposing view for any of those Democrats at all. Okay. I did not misspeak. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we have, I, I'm going to go over some things we have at the book table at the halfway point very briefly. We need your, um, we need your help to make it happen. Uh, the co-sponsors are just getting tighter and tighter with the wallet every single time, and so I'm left holding the bag. But uh, so you know, the this room back in the day, we used to get this room for 50 bucks, and now it's uh, close to 500, including for everything they're doing. So, and then we've got to cover our guest flight and his hotel stay, and and then you know the 20 postcards we mailed you. Why do we do that? By the way, number one is just to bludgeon you to remind you to come and then also if you have extra cards and you can share these cards with a friend you can just hand it uh, to someone and then you know get them to come we don't have a huge mailing list we don't just mail out to anybody the only people that get these cards are the people who have been here before if you haven't been here you don't get one really so over the years over 20 years uh, if you've been here you get one so we built up a, a pretty large list but <coughs> at any given meeting this is about how many people can make it because everybody's, you know, your schedule, your schedule is uh, tight as you prepare for, you know, potentially World War III and your, 
your stay at one of the camps that they have planned for you. So <laughs> make sure you pack well, like your mom taught you. Okay, uh, our speaker today uh, is Mr. Sam Dixon, and he's a lawyer, but don't hold that against him, because <laughs> we also have uh, Kyle Bristol here is also a lawyer. We, we've never held that against him. He's a great lawyer, actually, both of them are, and uh, they know each other. And uh, our speaker is going to talk today on uh, American-Russian relations, the war that's going on in the Ukraine, which is uh, the USA versus Russia, which is basically Satan versus Christianity. Sorry to say, that's where we're at right now. Welcome to the United States of Satan. So, uh, <laughs> he speaks Russian. He's the only guy I've ever met in my life that's been to Siberia. He's, he's a, he's a uh, honorary uh, American comrade of, of a small circle of white Russians. These are anti-communists. Who else would we have speak here? Um, <laughs> so, uh, without any uh, further delay, let me introduce to you Mr. Sam Dixon. Thank you. They say an expert is somebody who's 100 miles from home. <laughs> I, I can't claim to be an expert. I, uh, I don't have any credentials. I don't have a degree from Harvard in American-Russian relations. Um, but I do have a, a lifelong uh, feeling of, of affection for Russia, even when it was under the communists. Um, I, th I think, well first I'd like to say how happy I am to be here, how honored I am, how much I appreciate the invitation to speak here. Uh, I've had nothing but good experiences in Michigan. Uh, my parents came here when I was a child. Uh, I first ate a decent cherry here in Mac, Michigan in the one summer. I, I was introduced to Bing cherries and it's been a lifelong affection. Michigan is basically, it's one territory inhabited by different nations as is our country. Um, and you have the nation of Detroit, and then you have the rest of Michigan. And uh, they're very different creatures. I, I think a little bit about my connection with Russia. Uh, I was very, I was fascinated with Russia as a child. They, they had the old life magazines in the back of the, my elementary school classes. Uh, and I found myself drawn to the pictures of the Onion Dome churches. And uh, I'm reading a long article about the martyrdom of the Tsar and his family. Uh, and I started into, uh, I regarded Russians with great affection, even when they were communists, uh, and the real Russians. And then I, when I was at elementary school, I began studying Russian, and then I was very, very fortunate uh, to have as my tutor a, a wonderful, remarkable woman who was like a second mother to me, Natalia Alexeyevna Beklamishina. There's a Beklamishina tower at the Kremlin uh, dedicated to her family, and she was one of a small handful of people in her family who had survived the, the Bolshevik Revolution uh, in the so-called Russian Civil War, which N Natasha told me would be more properly called the War of Alien Conquest rather than a Russian Civil War. But anyway, she was, she was an amazing woman. Uh, she, had fought, she had been with the White Armies as a nurse. Uh, she was evacuated from Vladivostok at the conclusion of the Civil War. And she married an American doctor and ended up in Atlanta. And through her, I got a glimpse of what our white Christian European world was like before the catastrophe of World War I, uh, of what, what it was like when our world was ruled by genuine Christian aristocrats instead of what we have now. Uh, she was, I know that there's a Russian Orthodox priest here. He will, he will not like what I'm going to say, probably. but. Her first cousin became the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church under the communists. Uh, and she defended that against people who criticized the Russian church inside Russia. She said the whole country cannot emigrate. Someone has to maintain some semblance of Christianity. And she said the NKVD does infiltrate the Russian church. But she said the subversion works both ways. And she said the, the the, our God will subvert the agents that they send and will turn them into real Russians. And her, her nephew, who taught French and Russian in Atlanta, wrote a, a much acclaimed book that won the Chateaubriand Prize for Russian literature, uh, for, if any of the French literature, called The Turnaround. And it's about exactly what Natasha said. It's about a Soviet agent who is infiltrated into the Russian Orthodox Church, 
and has to pray and, and do all this, and gradually he is subverted and confesses to his superiors in the NKVD that he has become a believer. So anyway, I know a lot of Americans uh, don't approve of the, uh, the Russian Orthodox Church. I used to read things about how they were agents of the NKVD, but that was Natasha's uh, attitude on it, and I think it was probably a correct attitude, although I stand ready to be corrected by our priest. Anyway, in, in, in around 2012, I went and spoke at a peace rally in St. Petersburg, and then I went back to Russia in 2017, 2018, and spent a month there when I went to the services conducted by the Russian Orthodox Church at Yekaterinburg to mark the 100th anniversary of the martyrdom of the Tsar and his family. And, uh, and, and, mar and walked with the patriarch and 125,000 Russians uh, who walked from the site of the murder where they have erected a cathedral uh, to the mine where the remains of the royal family were found after the collapse of communism. So anyway, I can claim some familiarity with, with Russia. And certainly, as an American, I can claim some familiarity with our own unfortunate country. Uh, my own family came here uh, from Europe mostly before the revolution uh, and have played a, a small part in the history of our country. <coughs> I think in order to analyze our relationship with Russia, it is first necessary for us to understand who we are. You cannot evaluate something unless you understand who you are. The, the ancient Greeks inscribed seven sayings on the altar to Apollo at Delphi. Uh, the most famous of these these were, they took these sayings from what they called the, the seven sages of Greece at that time. The most famous of these to us in our world is uh, nothing in excess, you know, all, all moderation in all things. Uh, the other, the, the next most well-known one is know thyself, which I'm told by people who know ancient Greek is not really a very good translation, that the, the, the actual meaning of it is Know who you are. And knowing who you are is a much more profound thing than know thyself. It requires that you know who you are. You have to know your gender, which today has become <laughs> difficult in our progressive America. But you have to know who you are uh, in order to evaluate things. You know, who you are is, is everything. It's your gender, your race, your religion, your language, your literature, your social standing, your education. It's the whole package. And Americans don't really know who they are. Uh, we're told that we, have, uh, we, we live in a country uh, that is dedicated to a proposition. And unfortunately, that is true. Uh, as a, as it has become truer as the nation has aged and become more deteriorated uh, since the separation from, from England. It becomes truer every day. President Biden and others say that we are bound together by an ideal. Well, I don't know about you, but I can't live in an ideal. I can live in a country, but I can't live, and I can live being a member of people, but I cannot live in an idea. And we Americans are not, we were a curse from birth by having a very compromised nationality. Uh, I think one of the lessons that life teaches us is that you, if you don't succeed at something, you look at somebody who does succeed and you find out what he does. If your neighbor grows roses and your roses don't grow, you go ask your neighbor what he does and you find out. Well, the most strikingly successful people in the world today are the Jews. And, and we need to look to the Jews and see what they have done that has made them so remarkably successful uh, in this world. Uh, and there was an interesting statement by a Jewish rabbi named Stephen Wise, who's kind of the boss Jew in America back in the 1920s and 30s. And he was warning Jews against becoming Americans, which Jews do. They, they never connect to the country in which they live. Their, their connection is purely superficial. Uh, but he said, I, we have been Jews for thousands of years. We have been Americans for 200 years. And we should have looked at it the same way. We have been members of a community for thousands of years, long before the discovery of the New World, long before the Declaration of Independence, we were members of a people. Uh, and our <coughs> definition of who that people is has to grow. Uh, we have been riven 
I mean, divisions, uh, Irish versus Scots and English, which I grew up with. My parents and family d disliked the Irish intensely. Uh, but that's a, a family quarrel that has to be laid to rest. German versus Frenchman. That's a family quarrel that needs to be laid to rest. And now we have American versus Russian, which is a family quarrel that has to be laid to rest. So who are we? Uh, I think that we are blessed in, in having a, an, a, an existing situation in which who we are culturally and religiously fits remarkably into who we are racially. The, uh, we all share a culture and a civilization that is a blend of the paganism of antiquity filtered through the coming of Christ and Christianity and Christendom. Uh, that's true if you live in Vladivostok, it's true if you live in Berlin, if you live in London, if you live in uh, Dublin, if you live in, uh, in Atlanta, as I live. A, a Russian who sees a picture of the, uh, the Parthenon immediately knows what the Parthenon is, and he knows what the Parthenon says to him. So even though we have these linguistic differences and religious differences among, the, among our family, there is a basic cultural and civilizational imprint that we all understand and within which we can function. Uh, I hope someday we will have a genuine nation on the North American continent uh, in which we can actually live a, a European ethnostate. Uh, and I like to, to tell people we've got to be thinking on how to run that state. And the first question is who qualifies as a citizen? And I think the basic rule would be anyone whose ancestors were Nicene Creed Christians as of 1492 will fit in. That's an obscure thing to most of you, especially most of you who, like me, are Protestants and, who, and those who come from evangelical churches that don't have the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed uh, was created by a council in the third or fourth century that basically established what Christian Orthodox and lower O Christians believe, and it's adhered to by all the state religions, the Orthodox, the Roman Catholics, the Anglicans, the Lutherans, and the Presbyterians. And so, we really are bound together by that, and anybody who was a Nicene Creed Christian in 1492 uh, is racially acceptable. The thing about this formula is it includes everybody we want and it excludes the people that we want excluded. It includes the Latins, it includes the Teutons, it includes the Nordics, it includes the Slavs. Uh, everybody fits in, the Celts are included. So, I think, like Rabbi Stephen Weiss, Weiss said, we have to realize first that far beyond being Americans, uh, we are members of this expanded European Christian family. Uh, and in an increasingly small world, an ever smaller world, it's critical that we understand that in order to be able to evaluate our policies toward the Soviet Union and relations between Russians uh, and, um, and the Anglosphere, as they call it, basically the Anglo-Saxon, English-speaking world. <clears throat> Why are we hostile to Russia? There is no empirical reason for us to be hostile to Russia. The two great nations of the world that have spread our, our race and our civilization and religion around the world have been the Anglo-Saxons, with whom we are familiar, from the expansion to Canada and Australia and America. Uh, the Anglo-Saxons, have been a pioneer race. The other great pioneer race of our people have been the Russian people, who carried the, our civilization across one-sixth of the globe. Uh, and you know, These two pioneer people have no basis for any actual conflict. Americans share no border with, with Russia. There's no border dispute. Uh, we, have, we are natural trading partners. Nowadays, we have a Russian government that, that has uh, taken the heel off the church. Churches are rising all over Russia. Uh, Russians are nationally friendly to us. When I was in Russia, people were thrilled to see an American, especially one to whom they could talk and who was sympathetic to their country. There is no reason why we and the Russians should be at each other's throats. Russia is the guardian of our people. She guards us against the yellow peril. She guards us against the Chinese, who have one and a half billion people and who would love to colonize Siberia and Russia the way they are colonizing us. Uh, and anyone that has any, any illusions about what Chinese con conquest of our people's 
homelands is going to be. Just look to Tibet and Manchuria, and you see what this is going to be. Russia guards not only herself, but all Europe from penetration and dominance by a different race of people with a different language, not, a, not an Aryan language, not our religion, not our culture, but very, very different. So why is it that we are at odds with Russia? And this has much deeper tap roots than most people in America understand. The antagonism between the, these English-speaking people and the people of Russia goes back about at least two centuries, as, 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 base, as far as I can tell. And we can take as an example the, the Crimean War. Uh, the Crimean War took place in, 15, in 1857, and it, it had France and the British Empire fighting against Tsarist Russia. The Tsar of Russia at that time was Nicholas I. If you read any kind of standard history, you'll be told that Nicholas I was crazy. He was insane. Uh, he was demented. Well, that's not true. Uh, Nicholas I was what I call a racial idealist. He wanted to liberate the Slavic peoples of Europe from Turkish and Muslim rule. He, tried, he wanted to drive the Muslims and the Turks out of the Balkans and out of Constantinople. He offered peace to the, to the British and the French. He, he offered an agreement with them by which Russia would not annex any territory and Constantinople, when it was liberated, would be united to a, a Greece ruled by a German king. The British and French would have nothing of it because the usual suspects uh, were exciting the British and the French against Russia because they naturally hated Russia as a barrier to their economic penetration uh, and a country that was ruled by, by a monarch and by a Christian aristocracy that was opposed to them. All kinds of nonsense, the kind of nonsense we get today, was used to excite the people in the English-speaking world against Russia. Uh, they had the so-called great game, which I think was much like the, our, the way our deep, current deep state creates these foreign devils in order to get the American people to tax themselves, to support a bloated military, and surrender their freedoms to, to a, an aggressively anti-white government. Um, the, the idea was that Britain and Russia were, were fighting for control of, of these weird little countries, Uzbekistan and Afghanistan, that, that England had no interest in. Who would care? Let the Russians have them all. Let the Russians deal with them. We wouldn't have to deal with them. Let them have to deal with all these difficult people. It meant nothing. Uh, but that was portrayed to the people of Britain as, oh, the Russians are threatening us. Uh, they had religious lies. Uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury sent a uh, message out to be read to the people of, of Britain in their churches, saying that, that Russian orthodoxy was farther from Christianity than Islam, that Islam was closer to true Christianity, which is a total bunk, nonsense. You know, these are the people who have persecuted Christians all over the world, uh, overrun northern Africa, overrun Syria, overrun Anatolia, uh, the, their, their, the, the history of Islam is written in blood. It is not a tolerant religion, as I think everybody in this room knows. That, that it's a lie when we're told that they're tolerant. But anyway, there was a very, there was a very interesting book in the Crimean War by a, an author named Hugo, F I guess it's pronounced Figues, F-I-G-U-E-S, called the, Crim the Crimean War. Uh, and he, he, he's obviously somebody who is, is not on board with the system because he says things that no system historian would ever say. And, and one of these is he quotes a memo that one of the Tsar's ministers sent to him during the, the Crimean War. Britain and France uh, had these fake moral issues as our establishment uses uh, to cover the real purposes of its, its foreign policy. And they would say that they were defending the sovereignty of other nations, meaning the sovereignty of the anti-Christian Ottoman Empire. Uh, and the, the Jars minister pointed out that a few years before the Crimean War, there was a Greek Jew named Pedro. Uh, the, the Greek Jews are largely descendants of, of people who were, who were forced out of Spain by, by Isabella and Ferdinand in 1492. So they have Spanish names. This Greek Jew went to Britain and, and got 
British citizenship. He became a subject of the Queen. And he returned to Greece, where he was arrested for criminal activity and prosecuted. And the, the quote, British, end quote, media raised a tremendous hullabaloo uh, about this Greek Jew who had turned into an Englishman uh, and how it was anti-Semitism that had caused him to be prosecuted for this, this crime. The British sent the, the Royal Navy and threatened to shell Athens if the charges were not dropped against this Jew, Don Pedro. And the Greeks said, uncle, oh, they dropped it. Well, the Tsar's the Czar minister pointed out, this country that claims it's fighting for the sovereignty of small nations was willing to violate the sovereignty of Greece for one Jew. But they're unwilling to do anything about Turkey, which is oppressing tens of millions of Christians and has killed hundreds of thousands of Christians in horrific atrocities uh, in the Balkans. So that shows who was shaping British policy already uh, in the middle of the 1800s. But anyway, this, this hostility has deep, deep roots. And Russia has been interwoven with our own domestic affairs by studying this issue of why we are so hostile to Russia. We learn a lot about how our own country is run. In, in 1908, uh, William Howard Taft was elected president of the United States. And uh, the, the Russians had almost had a revolution. The, the, the Bolsheviks and the uh, socialists and the, the disaffected national elements had almost overthrown the monarchy in 1905. It was a real touch and go thing to put them down. Uh, and so the, the Russia was recovering from this revolution and from the defeat in the Russo-Japanese War. And Russia had a treaty, a commercial treaty with the United States that benefited both countries. And you can read about this if you read the biography, the autobiography of someone that I imagine many people here know named Jacob Schiff. Jacob Schiff was a Jewish banker in New York. He would achieve a much greater level of, of fame later on in the next decade when he became the financier of the Bolshevik Revolution and the man who, more than any other, funded the communist movement in Russia. Uh, but he led a delegation from his community to meet with President Taft to demand that this commercial treaty not be renewed because the Jews wanted to topple the monarchy. Uh, and they, uh, the Taft listened to them politely and he said, well, I sympathize with you. I, I don't believe in monarchy. Uh, and I, I, I don't believe in absolutism, which really didn't exist in Russia, but he thought it did. But anyway, he, uh, he said, but this treaty benefits American workers and American business. And I'm an American president and my foremost interest has to be those of my people. And Schiff told him, you are a lame duck president. We will end your career. And they did. They, they flattered this nincompoop named Theodore Roosevelt, uh, with this <coughs> craving for flattery that all politicians have. One of the odd things about politicians, the thing that unites them, is that they want to be loved by anonymous masses of people. So a weird thing, weird psychological trait that all these politicians have. They, they don't want a real family life. They don't want real friends. They don't want to put their feet up on the ottoman and read a book. They, they want to go from one empty meeting to another, shaking hands with people they don't know and will never see again. But anyway, and, and they, they have a huge appetite for flattery. If you want to get a politician on your side, you can just pour the flattery out like a bottle of syrup over him. He, 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 it's almost impossible to give them enough flattery in a democratic system, which is one reason why democratic systems don't work. You get the wrong kind of people running them. But anyway, they flattered Theodore Roosevelt, and they got him to run and split the Republican vote, and they put their patsy, Woodrow Wilson, in to run the country. And he, he ran it to, to the way they directed him to run it. But as far as I can tell, that is, Taft's action in 1908 of refusing the demand that he not renew the commercial treaty is the last time that any American president ever put our interest ahead of theirs. Uh, and so, World War I came, this horrific Peloponnesian War of our own, own era, you can count, I, I, I'm so old I count that as part of the, my era. But anyway, the, the communists took over Russia. In a, in a coup 
Uh, they overthrew, the, 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 the Tsar advocated, they overthrew the government, uh, the provisional government, which was run by this elected parliament that they had called the Duma. Uh, and there ensued this horrific civil war funded by people like Jacob Schiff in New York. Now, most of the members of the, of the Soviet, the Supreme Soviet in St. Petersburg uh, in, in 1917, when the revolution broke out, were living in New York City. They had a whole boatload of them that was put together uh, and shipped from New York.